We have the recording started. Very good. Welcome, welcome. Today's program about the magic of life insurance is about how people with various medical conditions and other risk factors can get a policy. Diabetes, cancer history, high blood pressure. There's maybe 30 different categories of risk that insurance companies look at. And as experts in that area and helping people who can, uh, who represent a higher risk get policies, um, we have some myths to bust. Um, this is kind of like a myth and fact section session. Um, one of the myths is that uh, for most, peop most people, I'm not insurable. Um, are there people who are not insurable? Yes. Uh, for example, I got a message last week from somebody who basically said, well, unfortunately, my neighbor had a severe stroke and they're in a coma and they're on life support. Can they get life insurance? And so my reaction is like, not really. So maybe they can get one of those policies that will give you a refund of premium plus a few bucks if they unfortunately die within the first two years or so, but that's not what you're looking for. So yeah, there are some people who unfortunately will not be eligible for life insurance. Um, and on the other end of the extreme, there are people who can get life insurance very easily. They're in good health, no hazardous hobbies. They don't travel to China every quarter, this kind of stuff. So in between, there's a huge amount of people who really are insurable. But why is it that people feel they are not insurable? Uh, we have found over the years that there's probably two reasons. One is that the broker directed them to the wrong company. Um, the fact of the matter is that companies have hot spots and different companies will excel and have a comfort level in underwriting certain types of cases. And other companies have other preferences. Um, one example of that is, um, I remember a number of years ago, the president of, a, of an insurance company was himself a pilot. He, he had a, a private pilot's license and they gobbled up a good part of the marketplace of people who were themselves private pilots because they had a very high comfort level and were very confident in underwriting pilots. Okay. Um, and that goes on. If the head of director, if the director of underwriting is himself a cardiologist, you can bet they're going to want some hard cases and things like that. Um, so that's reason number one, I think, that the broker, for whatever reason, applied for the wrong company. Maybe the broker didn't have an understanding of, of the niches that carriers like. Maybe the broker went for the company that would pay more pre commission. I'm not sure. But that's, I think, number one. And I think number two, is that um, the broker um, failed to have the client help the client navigate the normal hurdles and obstacles that that take place in underwriting um, there are challenges along the way and the broker has to quickly become an advocate and guide for the insured during the application process and i'll just give you a few examples um, i remember a case a number of years ago the guy ran a business, he owned a gas station, and he was a big advocate, a big player of Sunday softball, and he liked to drink beer. And he admitted that he drank a case of beer every Sunday by playing Sunday softball, a case of beer by himself. So the underwriter is like, what is this? And so I did some probing and I said, look, um, the fact of the matter is a year ago this time, he drank two cases of beer on the Sunday. So you got to look at the big picture. And fortunately, his labs were not that bad. He, he paid a bunch of money in extra premium, but he got coverage. Um, another example of advocacy, we had a case not too, a number of years ago where the applicant historically ran high on his PSA. It was much higher than anybody's comfortable with, but he always was high on his PCA, PSA. His father was always high on the PSA. So we were able to say, you know, this is, this is the abnormal is normal for him. And there was only a slight increase in premium. So, you know, we were able to put together a good picture for the underwriter. I think another case that I'll just mention 
in terms of advocacy and the kind of guidance that we need to provide was there was a client who ran a business in lower New York State. And there was a big business. It was like a distributor of paper, some kind of paper for industrial purposes. Healthy and you know middle aged and worked out every day and and a dynamic a personality. And so I got a, we got information from the underwriter that it says in his metal records he does cocaine. So I call him up and say, "What is this about cocaine?" He goes, "What do you mean cocaine? I never do cocaine. I never touched a drug in my life." I'm like, "Well, your your medical records say you do cocaine." He goes, "No way." I said, "We got to get to the bottom of this." So we called up the doctor. Just you know. He, he, this kind of guy, he called the doctor's office and demanded that everybody drop what they're doing and, and take a look at his file. And lo and behold, you know what happened? What happened was that the doctor's office had combined his file with somebody else. And that uh, somebody else did cocaine. And so when the and so the, the whole thing clipped together is what was sent to the insurance company. So the insurance company didn't look at the top of every page to see what's the patient's name. They saw our guy on the front and they assumed the rest of the file was for him. So he had to go, you know, they made a quick amendment on and on. And so we, we, we crossed that hurdle. So um, that is the kind of dedication and commitment that the broker needs to provide and to serve as an advocate and guide for people. Um, even if they don't have any kind of medical issues, underwriting can itself pose challenges and the, the broker and his team need to be able to guide the, the applicant and how to meet those challenges um, in order to get the result we want, which is an approval at the rate quoted. So having said all this, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Darren Hardison, the right arm of our organization. Darren is a life insurance underwriter and a financial planner. So this means not only can Darren work out the intricacies of, of underwriting and serve as a guide to get an approval, but he can look at the larger picture and help you make decisions on product and face amount and coverage period, all the planning type decisions that have to be made when you decide to put a, a life insurance policy into your financial portfolio. So Darren, um, why don't you pick up the baton here and, and familiarize us a little bit more with the underwriting process, um, especially for people that do have a medical history and what kind of challenges should they expect to face? Yeah, yeah, that's a good lead in. And Steve, excellent points. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I specifically don't wanna talk about specific impairments today. Uh, for our viewers, if you've got specific uh, medical history that that you'd like to discuss by all means um, schedule a time and we can talk about it right uh, you know and get get that under wraps but we're just talking underwriting or medical impairments in general today the two big points I think I wanted to hit on today is is to assure or remind our viewers that insurance companies are in business to sell policies. So, you know, we, we always, we joke about it. It's, well, it's the evil insurance company. They're gonna decline me, they're da, da, da. That's not how they make money. That's not why all the insurance companies uh, in whatever big city you live in, chances are they've got the tallest building in town. The insurance companies make a lot of money because they uh, work with uh, you know, advisors who sell a lot of policies. So um, I, I hear you. It can be frustrating at times, um, but both us as advisors and the insurance company, uh, we want to turn over uh, every stone to be sure we can get our clients insured. Um, and along those lines, um, I like to remind people or educate people that insurance companies, the underwriters, they're not underwriting things on an emotional basis. Uh, insurance companies are statistical creatures. Uh, insurance companies uh, are run by actuaries. Now, 
the sales guys might say differently, but it's actually the actuaries uh, that establish the underwriting guidelines uh, for the various companies. I was one of those actuary, or I was one of those underwriters that worked hand in hand with the actuaries, and it just came down to uh, mortality experience and the law of large numbers. And okay, we've got a hundred thousand people that have had quadruple bypasses. Uh, statistically, you know, we know this many are going to survive this many years. That's how they think, and they actually have. Uh, Again, I was that guy. We had underwriting manuals that told you, okay, if you've got somebody with a given condition, this is where you start. Um, and then, you know, with any condition or anything in the world, there's why is this one worse or why is this one better? And to what, you know, Steve was illustrating earlier is if you've got a person with a certain condition, oh gosh, that doesn't look good but let's, let's paint it in the most favorable light. Yeah, I'm, I'm diabetic and I take insulin, but since I was diagnosed, um, I've gone on an impeccable diet. I exercise, I, I run you know, 10 miles a week. I, I do all these extra things. So actuarially, in spite of the diabetes, that person is gonna have a very normal life expectancy. So again, as we're working with, with our clients, and we didn't talk specifically about pre-qualification today, but underwriting pre-qualification is where we're having conversations initially, and let's put it all out there. Let's, let's, let's uh, you know, compile um, a profile, if you will. I go out, I'll talk to all of our underwriters, and, you know, we know AIG is specifically aggressive towards certain things and Prudential is good at certain things or, you know, contrary. Transamerica, a fantastic company, they have horrendous service issues. I wouldn't send my worst enemy to Transamerica right now. Okay. So it's, it's understanding the business, understanding which companies are, are doing what. And um, yeah. I like that. You're exactly right. They have their hot spots. Um, so you, you mentioned with pre-qualification, you know, the goal here is to provide a quote that's both competitive and reliable because we want the clients to get an approval that they're quoted. And um, that is a hard thing to do, especially for the people that represent higher risks. And I remember um, when I first started doing pre-qualification a long time ago, I had to go like carrier by carrier by carrier and say, look, I'm going to give you quote information up front. Please give me a rate that you can commit to. And they're like, no, we never do that. The cases always <laughs> fall apart in underwriting because of stuff we're never told. I'm like, trust me, just on this one case. And it won't fall apart because I've done my homework. And then we can go to the second case. So, you know, it's a question of earning the trust of underwriters. But once underwriters know that in pre-qualification, we're going to, get, to inform them of all the underwriting issues, and they're going to get all the, the, the evidence they need, all the quote data they need, then they are willing to commit to a rate. And with the only exception being stuff that even the, the client didn't know, or that you know, something came up in, under, in, in their labs that they didn't know about. You know, right. Those are the exceptions. But the rule is, yeah, we get an approval at the rate quoted, and then it's a win-win-win because the underwriter gets the business, we get the sale, the client gets the coverage, as opposed to not pre-qualifying somebody and just submitting an application with a hope and a prayer that there's going to be an approval. Three months later, they either get declined or it's twice as high as the quote, and they say, no good, we don't want it. They don't get a policy, we don't get a sale. The company doesn't get the business and they've, they've wasted a lot of money in underwriting. Nobody wins. Well, that's, um, I, I laugh at these. I, I hear them on TV or, or I hear a, a radio spot. There's these groups, you know, select quote or all these, you know, various online versions. And conceptually, it sounds great. You can get a million dollars of life insurance for $2 <laughs> a month. Um, well, yeah, maybe, 
but they perform at best a very cursory, you know, give me your, your name, uh, date of birth and do you smoke? Well, that's, you know, two things out of like 27 things that, that can impact your rate. So what I wanted to comment, and I know we'll, we'll probably talk about pre-qualification on another seminar, but for our average client that we meet, um, you know, we've got a, a three page uh, pre-qualification form. So your person with just, I call it the average stuff, you know, it's, it's height and weight and it's just a cursory medical history prescription uh, medications are a big thing because that that tells me you know what type of issues the person has and just because you're on 27 uh, prescriptions that's a lot most people aren't um, it doesn't mean you're not going to qualify for a good rate so I guess you know we want to squash uh, you know that preconceived notion oh I'm, I'm 55 it's too late I can't afford coverage. Well, yeah, I mean, it gets more expensive every year we age, uh, the cost of insurance. Again, insurance companies are actuarial creatures. They know every year that you age, you're, you're one day you know, closer to, to life's great reward, um, but it doesn't mean you can't afford it. So I always encourage people, let's, let's see what the options are. Let's, let's see what the pricing is. Um, and maybe you know 12 companies are pricing at this level um and again to your earlier point this this company uh in our in our world they call it banding like the way they design the products for certain amounts at certain ages uh just cost less with with certain companies is that happenstance no that company specifically wants to build a book of business of you know 47 to 57 year olds for 250,000 to a million dollars actuaries are smart they think they know something so they want to beef up that book of business so again us we work for you we're just matching you uh, with the most efficient uh, you know company or product that's right and it's interesting you mentioned like the 55 uh, it brings to mind that companies, there are companies that want the senior business. There are companies that um, want want the older insureds in their yeah. book of business. And they'll, they'll impose certain requirements like cognitive testing and things um, to make sure, you know, to, the, to further assess what the risk is. So that drives home the point, there is a, comp a company for everybody. You know, there's, there's companies that like uh, that are more aggressive and people that travel or people that are have green cards uh, and on and on and on you know th there are several dozen categories of underwriting risk and you know if you if you look at the typical life insurance underwriting department they're not going to be able to specialize in every one of those right they have to put their best foot forward and and stay up and current with the trends in that particular field um and therefore they can become much more confident in taking on those risks yeah and companies companies are very streaky so um we see this internally for instance so if a client is looking for term insurance uh, based on current pricing and, and companies are competitive um, they're always trying to, to out out price or actually underprice. Uh, that next best. So uh, Banner Life, who's one of the most famous term life insurance companies, uh, they just reduced their rates. Well, Protective Life, another you know famous term life insurance company, they want to be the lowest. So then they reduce their rates. So when we do our you know our software, our quotes, it's you know it's Protective, Banner Life, AIG. Um, uh, nationwide, Prudential, whomever, but it's usually like those top three companies. So, you know, the client would say, well, why are you recommending we use protective over banner, even though it's $2 more a month? I'm like, well, protective right now, their service is, is phenomenal. We'll get a policy out, you know, within 30 days, um, you know, 60 days max. Uh, Protective has been very good at some of their accelerated underwriting. Um, another topic for another day, but what accelerated underwriting is, 
again, the companies don't want to spend any more money than they have to to underwrite people. So, you know, there's typically they order medical records, which can cost hundreds of dollars, you know, the copy service. There's uh, prescription database searches. There's all these, you know, uh, databases that they subscribe to. There's, uh, they do an insurance, a paramedical exam with blood and urine. So it gets very costly from an insurance company standpoint. So they're always looking for new ideas. How do we underwrite somebody thoroughly? Um, but not as expensively. So what a lot of companies are doing is they'll run like a database search and if, okay, the prescription check is negative, if this is negative and, you know, they have this little algorithm built in, then, you know, they can issue policies without a blood and urine. So there's, again, there's a lot of neat things that are available to clients, but by working with people like us who, you know, do this, uh, routinely, we can guide you and, and you know, make things, uh, you know, get the best outcome possible. That's very good. You know, so that's very good. So that's an example of not only um, will companies uh, become more competitive for underwriting conditions, um underwriting challenges whether it's medical or lifestyle or some kind of financial legal record but if people have certain preferences like some people don't want a medic to come they don't want to they don't want to have personal contact with mm -hmm. a medic or some people don't don't like needles um you know there's some personal preferences that people have and there are carriers out there that kind of accommodate that you know that, like you just said there are carriers who will compensate if somebody doesn't want to get a needle um, for a blood draw, there's ways around that where they can still intelligently underwrite somebody, not give away the store, give an accurate risk assessment, and bypass that requirement. So these are things that we would find out in interviews with the client. And the whole objective is to make the purchasing process as comfortable as possible, with a, as much integrity as possible, get them approved at the rate quoted. So at the end of the day, their experience was good and they got what they wanted at a good price. Right. You know, that's right. how life insurance should be bought, just like you're buying anything else. Um, life insurance just happens to be a pretty complicated underwriting process. Right. Um, and we make the best of it. All right, in light of our time, Darren, are there any other points you would like to make that people should know when it comes to uh, getting underwritten, especially if you have a higher risk factor? Yeah, I mean, the big thing is just, uh, you know, is, is let's have a discussion. You know, let's kind of, let's, let's leave our preconceived notions at the door. I can't qualify, it's too expensive. What type of life insurance? And, you know, let's just focus. Uh, you and I, Steve, we say all the time, underwriting is underwriting. It, it, it doesn't matter. The purpose of the insurance, the amount of the insurance for the most part, the type of insurance. Uh, trust me, I've underwritten multi million dollar estate planning, um, you know, life insurance policies to offset estate tax liabilities. And those have been much easier than someone looking for a hundred thousand dollar term policy just because of the dynamics of the case. Um, you know, whether there's medical, there's, you know, financial. Um, you know, avocations, I got rock climbers, mountain climbers, scuba divers, bungee jumpers, um, and all those things. It, it, I'll leave it at this. It's, it's rare that we can't find a solution uh, that our clients appreciate and, and uh, are, are thankful that, you know, that we were there to help them out. I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's anomalies and there's tough cases. And sometimes it's, I can't help you right now, but here's our waiting period. Maybe it's six months. I've got some cases like that where someone uh, is a cancer survivor. It's just, you know, the company makes us wait a little bit of time just to be sure there's no recurrence. Um, you know, the drug and alcohol, sometimes there's a little bit of a waiting period, um, but there's other options. Sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll patch in uh, accidental death. If you've got someone in their 30s, 40s, and even 50s, I mean, the ch again, statistically, the chances of, of you passing away, it's going to be from an accidental cause, not a medical impairment. So if you can't, if we can't qualify you today, 
for a traditional life insurance policy, uh, the accidental death we can use as kind of a stopgap uh, protection um, and, you know, until we're able to. Anyway, the, 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 the takeaway here is, is the sky's the limit and it's, it's rare we can't, uh, you know, come up with some sort of solution. That is true, and we have decades of testimonials to show for it. All right. That's good. All right, thank you, Darren. Thank you, everybody. Stay tuned. Um, look at your schedule because we have a seminar every month. The next one is in September. Have a good rest of your day. All right, guys. Thank you.